I sat down with Mayor Tubbs earlier to hear more about how the people of his town are coping with the COVID-19 crisis and his thoughts on the controversial gig economy. I am incredibly proud of the resilience of, of, of the folks I get to represent as mayor. Although I'm saddened about how often they have to be resilient. Um, we just had the 2008 recession hit Stockton incredibly hard. We were the foreclosure capital of the country um, for two years. Um, folks had their life savings wiped out. And then we had municipal bankruptcy, where we had folks who lost some of their um, health care provisions as, and the retirement package as a result of the restructuring that came from bankruptcy. And now we have COVID-19 I'm in this looming depression recession. So we're hearing it from, from our folks. Like folks are stressed and anxious about distance learning and about other kids really getting the education they deserve. They're worried about whether it's safe to go back to work, even though they want to go back to work. They're worried about how to make payroll as a small business and not wanting to lay off the nine people on their staff that are like family to them, but also wanting to make sure they have enough for their families. They're worried about making the rent. Um, there are so many of our folks are essential workers who are in the day camps and, and migrant workers who weren't given the PP protection they needed. So it's it's a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, a reminder of kind of where we've been in terms of the economics and the economic hardships face. But I think in a perverse way, because we've been through so many hard times as a community, that there is not a a resignation to it, but it's a feeling like, okay, we've done this before and we'll weather it all together. You've spoken about the gig economy in the past, Uber and Lyft drivers, for example, a lot of people rely on that for extra work, but the work there has plummeted unless you're delivering food. We just did a story at Bloomberg about people hanging smartphones in trees near Amazon warehouses so they can be the first to get contacted about deliveries. What's your view wow. into that kind of desperation? Yeah, I, I, I think that's just so, in, the gig economy to me is so interesting for a variety of reasons. I think on one hand, you want to applaud the innovation. I know Uber and Lyft has made my life easier in many respects. Um, but on the other hand, you have to think about what type of society or, 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 or country do we live in where folks are driving, working, and then having to drive another eight hours after work to make, make pay bills? Or what type of society do we live in where folks are willing to work without benefits and, and, and without like consistent pay because there's no real other options and, and or there's not a real safety net that will allow them to make other choices. So I'm, I'm always torn in discussions about the gig economy, but I think the desperation is real. I think it also puts to notion, puts to rest this notion that people don't want to work, that people don't want to provide that people don't want to contribute. No, people are super creative and doing all types of things to make money and not to make money for like luxurious things. Like folks are just paying off debt, paying for private school for their kids maybe, paying, paying, paying for healthcare costs, paying rent. And, it, and it's, it's it, I think to your point, it just shows just the savage nature in many respects and uh, of our economy and how as we rebound from COVID-19, we, we have to establish some guardrails so that folks are okay, particularly at a time when folks like Jeff Bezos have in, in an incredibly short amount of time have amassed even more wealth, right? And, and, and while people are are, 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 are are hanging phones outside their, <laughs> their warehouses to get a $10 ride, it's, yeah. We just covered a big protest in front of Bezos's mansion in Washington, D.C., where you had Amazon workers calling for a rise in their minimum wage, which is $15. They want $30 an hour. Is that fair? I haven't seen the, the economics, but I know D.C. is expensive. But I do think I, I agree with the point if in five months Jeff Bezos' net worth can improve, I think, what, $20 billion? That, the folks who created his wealth, his workers, should see some of that rise. And they should at least be paid a wage that allows them to pay for necessities like rent and food and housing. And we know $15 an hour in Washington, D.C. is not it. 
if the number is 30, if the number is 25, there is a number that gets to a place where folks who are creating wealth for someone who's not losing money, he's not hemorrhaging money, he's amassing massive amounts of wealth during this time, should be able to at least provide a baseline level of dignity for the folks who created his wealth. And do you think that companies like Uber and Lyft, I'm sure you've looked at the California law, AB5, that uh, would require these companies to make workers full-time employees with benefits. Do you think that they should have to do that, which would dramatically change their business models? Yeah, I, I think that there has to be a, a conversation around sort of how do we make sure all workers have the benefits necessary and, and, and protections necessary. So I know there's proposals around portable benefits with an understanding that some people want to be independent contractors. For some people, not the majority of people, but there are people who better, who actually enjoy being independent contractors, who enjoy sort of the flexibility of the job, who enjoy coming in when they want, clocking out when they want, et cetera, um, and not having to work a consistent schedule. Um, so, so I think that the issue is that we have all these folks who are working who don't have portable benefits, who are sleeping in their Uber cars, who aren't seeing a, a share of, 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 of kind of the profits made by their labor, and that there should be some way in which they're, that's reflecting their compensation, particularly around benefits. And if it's portable benefits, that makes a lot of sense. If it's full-time employment, that makes a lot, I think it's just really both Uber, Lyft, drivers, state legislator, and the governor are actually coming to the table with a solutions mindset in terms of though this, we can disagree about the solution, but let's agree on the problem and let's work collaboratively to get to a solution that, that, that answers the problem we're trying to solve. A huge theme of the HBO documentary is education as a tool of advancement. You mentioned that with your own education. Obviously, our education system across the country is grappling with great inequities. Some kids don't have access to even the Internet, let alone the devices they need to use the Internet. What are your biggest concerns at this moment about the future of education and the children of your own community? My biggest concern is actually about sort of how we're going to mitigate the impacts of the last year, because we know that children's brains are still developing. We know the impact of adverse childhood experiences and how it reverberates 20, 30 years down the line in terms of cortisol levels in the brain, in terms of stress levels, in terms of um, crimes that are committed, in terms of core mobilities and health issues. And I, and, and I don't see how being stuck at, in a house uh, with parents who are stressed and anxious and trying to make, bills, make sure the bills are met when school for a lot of our kids, unfortunately, was the one safe place, one place where they could eat, for some kids, a place where they would get their clothes washed, how not having access to that and the socialization from peers, how that's not going to have an impact on their, on their just the, the, their development into adulthood. So I'm incredibly worried and trying to think through as a city, what can we do during COVID, but especially after COVID, to make sure that our babies are okay? That, that we do everything we can to mitigate the, the impacts of these adverse childhood experiences that they're experiencing every day during this pandemic. And then on the education front, I think that's compounded with, we already know the research tells us that summer brain drain, that the three months stay at home in the summer actually is one of the biggest levers for the achievement gap and one of the biggest levers for educational inequity, that kids can lose a whole entire years of learning by spending three months at, at home in the summer not doing anything. So you compound that with this distance learning thing and all kids not having access to the internet. But even if access to the internet, given the housing issues we're seeing in communities across this country, most kids don't have a dedicated quiet spot to study, particularly if they have peer, I mean, relatives who are working from home as well. And then they have brothers and cousins. So just all that chaos, I, I, I think that it's going to be a challenge, but it's going to be incumbent on all of us to understand that it's in our best interest as a community, as a collective, to make sure during COVID, but especially after COVID, we provide, even if necessary, extra resources to kids who we know didn't have the same amount of inputs during COVID. 